At the beginning of the third meditation, Descartes gives a really nice recap of uh, what had happened in the previous two meditations and indeed of the entire project of the meditations. <clears throat> And so if you're struggling with um, how the various pieces of the meditations fit together, why he's doing what he's doing, um, the first few paragraphs, first couple paragraphs of the third meditation is a good place to look. It's a fairly clear, accessible overview of the entire project. <clears throat> Very quickly, what is that project? What have we covered so far? Um, Start from the beginning where we've kind of started. So this is all by way of review. This is stuff we've covered in previous videos. <clears throat> uh, Descartes rendered the scientific revolution, the way he and other proponents of the scientific revolution understood it. Uh, they understood it as a rejection of Aristotelian science of the Aristotelian intellectual paradigm. Uh, 1800 years of science had to be kind of thrown out. It was in vain. Those inquiries were in vain. They were useless. Descartes uh, is trying to find foundations for the new science. Descartes thinks that one of the things that went wrong with the old Aristotelian paradigm is that it was uh, built upon, this view of the world was built upon certain false beliefs certain beliefs that were false. So in particular, um, one of the things we talked about was um, this idea that the universe and all of the parts of the universe, all of the things in the universe is teleologically ordered, that everything in the universe has a purpose or end or goal towards which it is uh, in some sense striving. False. The Aristotelian paradigm is built upon this idea that's a foundational belief for the Aristotelian understanding of the world, and it's false. And we saw in the first video how that view, this teleological view, led to geocentrism. Uh, and geocentrism, of course, is false, and Descartes and the other proponents of the scientific revolution knew that, had discovered that. We don't want the new science to succumb to the same uh, uh, problem. Uh, or succumb to the same fate as the old Aristotelian science. We don't want this new science to be in vain. And so uh, Descartes' project in the meditations is to find foundations for the new science that will ensure that the new science will not succumb to that fate. And his idea is, well, <clears throat> we need the best foundations possible. We need foundations which couldn't possibly turn out to be faulty. We need foundations that are absolutely certain. That's Descartes' idea. We're going to look for foundations that are absolutely certain, and then our understanding of the world will ultimately be based on these absolutely certain foundations. And what that's going to ensure is that our understanding of the world will not need to be entirely scrapped in the way that the Aristotelian understanding of the world had to be entirely scrapped. Okay, how are you going to find these? Descartes' idea is, well, look, something is absolutely certain if it can't be doubted. It's absolutely certain if it can't be doubted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to uh, doubt everything that can possibly be doubted. Call into doubt everything that can possibly be doubted. And if something can be doubted, well, then it can't serve as a foundation for the new science. I'm going to come up with certain hypotheses or thought experiments, ideas uh, that call things into doubt. And what I'm going to look for, Descartes, this is Descartes' project, what I'm going to look for is a hypothesis that calls into doubt everything that could possibly be doubted. And in the first meditation, he claims to find that it's this deceiving God hypothesis. Everything that could possibly be doubted is called into doubt by that hypothesis. And so everything that that hypothesis calls into doubt can't serve as the foundation for uh, human knowledge, in Descartes' view. And so what he's going to do then is look for some belief that the deceiving God hypothesis doesn't call into doubt because if the deceiving God hypothesis doesn't call it into doubt, well, then it's absolutely certain. It can't be doubted. And in the second meditation, he claims to find such a belief or two, depending on how you count it, I guess. I think I exist. There you go. 
that can't be doubted because even if there's a deceiving God, um, well, he has to be deceiving me, right? And so I have to exist. That's Descartes' idea. Okay, so those are good. There's a, a couple beliefs that um, are absolutely certain, can't be doubted. Great, perfect. <clears throat> now, you might think, however, that's really meager. I think I exist. How are you going to establish an entire understanding of the world on the basis of the mere fact that you think and you exist? Still, at this point, Descartes assuming there's a deceiving God. And so, you know, I have a hand. Who knows? Maybe not. Maybe that's just a deceiving God deceiving you. You can't um, help yourself to that belief just yet. And so all we can help ourselves to at this point is I think I exist. And he says something uh, kind of very brief in the second meditation about how um, well, you can also be certain that it appears to you that there's a hand. Okay, fine. That's still all very meager. How are you going to possibly found physics, say, or biology or chemistry or all of the other sciences, all of human knowledge on this very, on these couple beliefs, the fact that you exist? Uh, we still don't even know if there's an external world out there. We still don't even know if there's, if you know, material reality, things you can touch and feel and see and so on. Don't know if that's actually there. That all might be a deceiving God. And so still at this point, all of physics, all of science could just be a big deception. So how are we going to possibly um, proceed to found all of human knowledge on this very meager basis? I think I exist. The third meditation is really supposed to be the, 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 the main project of the third meditation. Or the main upshot of it, if you will, is to push forward and, sh and ultimately lay the groundwork for how we're going to found everything. It's going to try to take this very meager basis that we have, I think I exist, and expand upon it. Show how that can serve ultimately to found all of human knowledge. Now, Descartes is going to do this <clears throat> by extracting what people call the truth rule. Descartes doesn't call it the truth rule, uh, but this is what people call it. <clears throat> so this is near the very beginning of the third meditations. Descartes is reflecting upon um, the second meditation, about, upon the things he had just um, uh, discovered or said or thought or whatever in the second meditation. And he's saying, oh, the cogito, I think I exist. That was really good. That, that worked. That was great. Well, what was so great about it, Descartes asked himself. And he says, oh, I know what it was. I vividly and clearly perceived it. That's what made it so great. That's why I you know, felt so certain about it. I vividly and clearly perceived the cogito. And so Descartes then says, well, hey, doesn't that uh, kind of key me into what I need in order to know something? I just need to vividly and clearly perceive it. If I can vividly and clearly perceive a thing, well, I can be certain that it's true. That's the truth rule. So Descartes tries to extract, and this is the way people talk about it, he tries to extract the truth rule from the cogito, right? He's thinking about the cogito. I think I exist. And he says, well, look, there seems to be maybe a general principle at play. What made the cogito so great was that I vividly and clearly perceived it. Well, maybe whatever I vividly and clearly perceive is true. Well, that would be great, especially for Descartes, because Descartes thinks that we vividly and clearly perceive a lot of things. Um, more or less all of mathematics is vividly and clearly perceived. And so if the truth rule is true, well, now Descartes can throw all of mathematics into the edifice of human knowledge. He'll have gotten himself that. He can throw that into his uh, building of knowledge or whatever, right? He also thinks certain foundational principles of physics um, are going to be true, certain laws about um, uh, conservation and so on. Um, and so even kind of some very rudimentary basic ideas of physics, uh, he'll be able to throw onto this structure of knowledge if the truth rule is true. And so I think I exist. Yeah, that's very meager. How are you going to found all of human knowledge on it? 
the, well, Descartes' answer is, well, look, we extract the truth rule from it. And the truth rule, that is not meager. That would give us a whole bunch of knowledge, all of mathematics, some basic principles of physics. And so the truth rule, not meager, that's strong. You can build a lot on the back of the truth rule. But there is a problem. How can I be sure that the truth rule is true? What if there's a deceiving God? This was, the, this was um, a problem that Descartes had raised when he had introduced the deceiving God hypothesis in the first place. One of the things he said about this hypothesis, what made it so strong, was that it called into doubt things that I seemed most certain about. Descartes mentions the truths of mathematics. The deceiving God hypothesis calls into doubt those truths because what if there's a deceiving God who's deceiving me? And so when I think two plus two equals four, I feel that that's absolutely certain, but maybe that's just because there's a deceiving God who's deceiving me about that and implanting a feeling of certainty into me. Maybe, Descartes thinks, right? This is the idea behind the deceiving God hypothesis. Maybe two plus two actually equals five. But when I think about that, I just think there's no way that's true. Well, that's the deceiving God deceiving you. And when I think two plus two equals four, it doesn't actually, but I feel certain because the deceiving God is deceiving me, right? This is an all powerful deceiving God. And so uh, maybe I'm deceived even about those kinds of things, right? And so Descartes at the beginning of the third meditation, he extracts this truth rule. This would be great if whatever I vividly and clearly perceive is true, if I could establish that, if I could throw that onto, uh, in, into the foundation, so to speak, of this um, edifice of human knowledge, that would be great. But there's a problem, I can't do it quite yet because there might be this deceiving God. Well, how are we gonna get around this problem? Descartes' plan is to prove that God does indeed exist, but that God is not a deceiver that God would never deceive us, that any omnipotent being, Descartes thinks there's only one, that any omnipotent being would never deceive us. And so we can prove that there is an omnipotent being, but that it's not a deceiver. That's gonna be Descartes' plan. And if we do that, well then we'll eliminate the deceiving God hypothesis. We'll have shown that any omnipotent being, any being that's, you know, worthy of the name God, not a deceiver. And so we don't need to worry about there being a deceiving God anymore. If we show that God exists but is not a deceiver, that will eliminate, according to Descartes, the only reason we have for doubting the truth rule. And having eliminated that only reason for doubt, Descartes thinks, we can then throw the truth rule into the, um, you know, use it as a foundational belief for further human knowledge, right? We, we can help ourselves to the truth rule. We can start building on top of that. That's the idea. And so Descartes and the third meditation, the main project of the third meditation is to validate the truth rule. <clears throat> He's going to do that by uh, proving that a non-deceiving God exists. That's the project of the third meditation. Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> crucial to his art. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn to the argument for the existence of God. That's going to take up uh, most of our time. And then we're going to turn to his argument that God is not a deceiver. We find both of these arguments in the third meditation. Uh, the argument for the existence of God takes up the majority of the third meditation. The argument that God's not a deceiver uh, is very quick. It's very brief. And we'll spend much less time on it. All right. Central to Descartes' argument that God exists is a distinction between intrinsic and representative reality. Um, he often, he treats reality and perfection as synonyms. They mean the same thing. They refer to the same thing. 
why he does it. He's picking up on older philosophical terminology. Just go with it. Whenever you see reality in Descartes, you could substitute that with perfection and vice versa. And so we have this distinction between intrinsic and representative reality. What does this mean? This is going to be crucial for the argument. The argument for the existence of God really hinges on this distinction. And so we're going to want to understand how it works. And so what I want to do right now is just discuss what this distinction is. So put to the side all of these other things that Descartes is doing, all these worries about, well, maybe there's a deceiving God, or maybe you're in a dream, and who knows anything, and maybe the external world doesn't exist. For the sake of understanding this distinction, don't worry about those things. We're going to assume things exist, right? I'm going to give an illustration of how this distinction works. Um, uh, don't worry about, well, how do you know things actually exist, and so on. We're not going to have those worries as we're when we're just trying to understand what this distinction is because Descartes, Descartes assuming a certain uh, degree of familiarity with this distinction he's picking up on this distinction from other people uh, and would assume that the reader would kind of have some ideas what's going on I'm not assuming you have any idea what this distinction means uh, and so I want to explain it for you guys okay so the idea is something like this again don't worry about how do you know anything how do you know there's anything out there right okay here's the distinction Intrinsic reality is the kind of reality that actually existing things have, right? So your hand, your computer, uh, the tree outside, your bed, whatever. All of these actually existing things have what Descartes would call intrinsic reality. Again, don't worry about, well, look, those things don't exist according to Descartes and put all that to the side. But what this distinction is picking up on is the fact that those things, your hand, the tree, your bed, whatever, they can also exist in some sense in your mind. You can have an idea of them. And when you have an idea of, say, the tree or whatever, <clears throat> it's not like there's an actually existing tree in your mind that would, I don't know, that would hurt. Rather, there is an idea of a tree, and an idea is going to have a different kind of reality than the actually existing tree. The actually existing tree has intrinsic reality. The content of your idea, the tree in your mind, doesn't have intrinsic reality. If it did, it'd be an actually existing tree. Rather, it has representative reality. That's the distinction. So let's see an illustration of this. So there's um, <clears throat> a guy, yeah, and let's say he's looking at a rose. So there he is looking at a rose. And while he's looking at the rose, uh, he's going to have an idea of the rose. Um, the rose causes, gives rise to this idea of the rose in his mind. All right, so there we go. So that's what, uh, right? So you got the actually existing rose out there, and you have the idea of the rose in the guy's mind. The actually existing rose out there has intrinsic reality. The rose in the guy's mind doesn't have intrinsic reality. It's not an actually existing rose. Rather, it has representative reality. Yeah, the actually existing thing intrinsic reality your idea of that actually existing thing representative reality right the content of ideas uh has representative reality that's the idea that's the distinction yeah okay <clears throat> so what's uh, uh how does any of this have to do with uh, uh what does any of this have to do with god with an argument or whatever well, Descartes uses this distinction in a, uh, what I'm going to call, uh, well, he uses it in the central premise of his argument for the existence of God. This central premise I'm going to call the causal principle of ideas. <clears throat> this is a premise in the argument for the existence of God. This distinction between intrinsic and representative reality uh, uh, is essential to understanding this causal principle of ideas. All right, so what is the causal principle of ideas? How does this work? 
Descartes' idea is something like the following. Even in what I was just saying, uh, we kind of had a glimpse of what Descartes' idea is here. The actually existing rows, the rows with intrinsic reality, causes your idea of the rows, causes uh, this thing with representative reality. Well, what Descartes says, right? So there's the rose that's the cause of my idea of the rose, right? That's what I was just saying. So this rose right here causes that rose right there, yeah? Okay, fine, easy enough, fair enough. The causal principle of ideas states that the cause of an idea must have at least as much intrinsic reality as the idea has representative reality. So, in our example here, our illustration, the cause of my idea of the rose is the actually existing rose. And so what the causal principle of ideas would state is that the actually existing rose must have at least as much intrinsic reality, that's the kind of reality that actually existing things have after all, right? So the actually existing rows must have at least as much intrinsic reality as my idea of the rows has representative reality. Now, to illustrate uh, in a little bit more intuitive terms what's going on here, I'm gonna talk about units of reality. Descartes doesn't think there are units of reality, um, doesn't think it can be compared that way, but I, I think it's helpful for understanding these comparative claims. So let's say that my idea of the rows, right, that thing right there, has five units of reality. I'm just making up a number. What the causal principle idea, uh, causal principle of ideas says is that the actually existing rows then must have at least five units of reality. It might have 10, it might have a million. It's got to have at least five. If it caused an idea that had five units of representative reality. That's the causal principle of ideas. <clears throat> It might be the case that your idea of the rose only has three units of representative reality, but the actually existing rose has five. That's fine. That's not a violation of the causal principle of ideas. That's fine, according to Descartes. What the causal principle of ideas rules out is that um, <clears throat> your idea of the rose has more representative reality than the actually existing rows. Your idea of the rows, uh, if we're following the causal principle of ideas, could not have 10 units of reality while the actually existing rows only had five. Your idea of the rows could not have 10 units of representative reality while the actually existing rows only had five units of intrinsic reality. That's what the causal principle of ideas rules out. And thinking about it, you might think, I don't know, that makes a little bit of sense. Descartes thinks this causal principle of ideas is known by the natural light. It's evident by the light of nature, he says. And as we saw last time, what that means, Descartes would also say, uh, uh, knowing something by the natural light, vividly and clearly perceive it. Descartes would say the causal principle of ideas, we vividly and clearly perceive it. Or, he uses this terminology less often, but he could also say, we intuit it, right? We intuit the causal principle of ideas. It's just strikes us as true, self-evident. You might think, yeah, I don't know, there's something to be, yeah, maybe, right? Think, uh, why would you think something like that? Well, let's say, the rose, the, uh, your idea of the rose did have more representative reality than the actually existing rose, the thing which caused your idea had intrinsic reality. Well, that would be real. How could that possibly happen? That seems impossible. Where did that extra reality 
come from, right? So if uh, the idea of the rose has 10 units of representative reality and you wanted to say, well, maybe the, the actually existing rose only has five units of intrinsic reality, well, the problem would be where did those extra five units of reality come from, right? If the idea of the rose has 10 and the actually existing rose only has five, well, that's a difference of five units of reality. And where on earth did those five units come from? If indeed the actually existing rose was the cause of your idea of the rose. It seems like those five extra units of representative reality came out of nowhere. That's impossible. They couldn't just come out of nowhere, All right? Uh, the idea can only have as much reality or perfection as the cause of that idea. My idea of the rose, you can think of it in terms, um, to make it a little bit more intuitive, you can think of it in terms of information. My idea of the rose can't have more information in it than the actually existing rose. I mean, if anything, it seems like it probably have less because it's not as though your minds perfectly capture every detail. And if it has less, that's fine according to the causal principle of ideas. What the causal principle of ideas rules out is that it has more. And you might think, well, yeah, that seems kind of intuitive or that seems, yeah, maybe that's true. That seems sensible, yeah? Because where would that extra information, that extra reality possibly come from? Yeah, that's the idea. All right. So that's the causal principle of ideas. This is the hardest part of the argument. This is uh, difficult, it uses technical terminology. And so I would suggest if you're having trouble understanding this principle, um, perhaps going back and rewatching the video just on this principle or on this distinction or something, it's very important to understand this causal principle of ideas. Um, because it's gonna be impossible to understand um, the argument for the existence of God without understanding this causal principle of ideas. All right, so let's turn now to that argument, the causal argument for the existence of God. Um, in the meditations, this argument is kind of spread out. He does a lot of different things in the middle of it, uh, but you'll find it on pages 13 to 19. Uh, so it kind of starts around 13. That's when he starts talking about intrinsic reality versus representative reality. And he starts um, kind of laying the groundwork for this causal principle of ideas. And then by the time you get to 19, you get a very clear statement that <clears throat> of how exactly the argument uh, concludes, how it's working. And so it's kind of, uh, the argument itself is not ever clearly and directly expressed in these, uh, in these pages, but it's contained within those pages there. So first premise of this argument, what we've just been talking about, is causal principle of ideas. Uh, cause of an idea must have at least as much intrinsic reality as the idea is representative reality. All right, fine. Where do we go from there? Well, Descartes says something like this, look, <clears throat> Look through your mind. So yeah, there might be a deceiving God. Who knows if anything exists other than me and myself. Okay, fine. But nonetheless, I can kind of like, I've got a lot of ideas of things. Uh, you know, it seems to me like there's a hand right there and I got an idea of hand. And uh, who knows if there is actually a hand, there might be a deceiving God, blah, blah, blah. But I have that idea in my mind. Well, look, I can kind of just cycle through these ideas. Who knows whether any of them actually exist? Who knows whether there actually exist any hands? But I certainly have the idea of a hand, yeah? Well, look, another idea that I have is an idea of God. That is to say, uh, I've got an idea of a kind of supremely good, supremely powerful, supremely knowledgeable being, an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent being. Or as Descartes puts it, using his fancy terminology, I have an idea that has infinite representative reality. Uh, being, uh, I have an idea that has infinite representative perfection, right? I have an idea of something that is infinitely perfect. That's another way of putting the idea um, or putting Descartes' claim here, right? I have an idea of God. And he would want to say, all of us do. He's not saying all of us believe God exists. Who knows whether God exists? We don't know that yet. All I'm saying at this point, Descartes would say, is that you have an idea of a God. 
Yeah, sure. Religious believers, uh, theists, uh, as they're called in philosophy circles, they have an idea of God. Well, yeah, sure, fine. They believe God exists. But Descartes would say at this point, look, I'm not saying God exists at this point. Even atheists have an idea of God. Atheists or agnostics, people who don't know if God exists, people who believe God doesn't exist. They have an idea of God. I'm not saying anything in the second claim that an atheist couldn't be on board with, right? Who knows whether God exists? I'm not saying God exists. I'm saying simply that I have an idea of God. And atheists have an idea of God. They say, yeah, I have that idea, and there's nothing in reality that corresponds to it. God doesn't exist. That thing that I have an idea of doesn't exist in reality. That's what it is to be an atheist. And Descartes is saying, fine, that's, at this point, all I'm claiming is that I have an idea of God. And uh, everybody does, he thinks. Uh, he doesn't know. Uh, that's what you would ultimately say, right? And so even atheists have an idea of God. And moreover, um, what he's saying is not just, um, how to clarify this. The Greeks who believed in Zeus and Poseidon and uh, Ares and whatever, all these other gods or whatever. Descartes would say, yeah, sure, fine. People have those ideas. And I just brought those ideas to your mind, saying Zeus, whatever. But when I say I have an idea of God, I'm not saying I have an idea of Zeus. I'm picking out a particular idea because even the Greeks, you'd want to say, they have an idea of a being that is totally perfect. That's not Zeus, right? Read any story about Zeus. That guy was not totally perfect. Um, well, whatever. I'm going to get into details there. Um, <clears throat> those Greek gods were not totally perfect. Descartes would want to say, even the Greeks, though, have this idea. None of their gods kind of corresponded to it, but if, if you were to ask them, if you were to, they would have this idea, right, if you go back in time. And so they might not have thought that there was any such being. They thought their gods were these kind of anthropomorphic, imperfect things that went around doing all kinds of nefarious things. Um... Nonetheless, they still have an idea of an infinitely perfect being, right? It's in the catalog of ideas that you have. You got Zeus there, you got Ares, you got your hands, you got, you know, whatever, tacos. Well, another thing in there, infinitely perfect being. That's Descartes' idea. Okay, so that's all he's saying at the second point. <clears throat> well, look. What is that idea? It's an idea that has infinite representative reality. Well, in light of the causal principle of ideas, that idea, my idea of God, must have been caused by something that has infinite intrinsic reality, right? The cause of an idea must have at least as much intrinsic reality as the idea has representative reality. Well, I have an idea of God. It had a come from somewhere. It's got a cause. What the causal principle of ideas implies is that uh, the cause of my idea of God must have been something with infinite intrinsic reality, right? The cause of an idea must have at least as much intrinsic reality as the idea has representative reality. My idea of God has infinite re uh, representative reality. And so the cause of my idea of God must have infinite intrinsic reality, right? It has to have at least as much reality as my idea. Yeah, my idea is infinite reality. And so the cause of my idea must have infinite reality, right? But that's just to say that a being with infinite reality exists, right? A being with infinite reality caused my idea of that being nothing else could have caused my idea of that being. I could not have caused my idea of God. Why? I don't have infinite reality, right? If I, whatever ideas I cause can only have as much reality as I have, can only have as much perfection as I have. <clears throat> 
I am a finite creature. I have a finite degree or amount of reality or perfection. That means the ideas that I cause, if I do cause any, can only have a finite amount of representative reality. But this idea of God that I have, that I just find it there, right? It's just in my mind. I don't know. This infinitely perfect thing must have been caused by something other than me, basically, right? Because I'm finite. I have finite reality. It must have been caused by something that has infinite reality. It must have been caused by God. And so the basic idea behind this causal argument for the existence of God is something like this. I have an idea of God, of this infinitely perfect being. The only thing that could have possibly caused that idea to be there is God. And so God must exist, and God must have put that idea there. If God didn't exist, I could not possibly have an idea of God. I could not possibly have, that is to say, an idea that has infinite representative reality. And so God must exist, and God must have caused my idea of God. That's the argument, right? And so Descartes at this point thinks he's established. God exists. We start from my idea of God, and then in virtue of the causal principle of ideas, we see, well, the only thing that could have caused that idea is God, and so God has to exist. Okay. Let's turn now to uh, the most kind of prominent criticisms or problems that people have raised for uh, Descartes' argument here. <clears throat> um, I'm going to break them up into two different kinds. I mean, there have been variations on these two different kinds of problems. Uh, the second kind of problem, I think, uh, I think this is the consensus of other people, of, uh, uh, other of, uh, Descartes scholars. The second kind of problem is more serious than the first kind. All right, so this first kind of problem, uh, you might, uh, people have raised with regard to this causal principle of ideas, right? And there's a statement of it just to remind you, the cause and idea must have at least as much intrinsic reality as the idea has representative reality. What's the problem here? Is that even true? This is a kind of skeptical question that people have raised about this causal principle of ideas. Does this accurately uh, map onto the world? Do our ideas actually have representative reality? Do things existing out there in the world actually have intrinsic reality? This is not at all an intuitive distinction, you might think. It's not obvious. This isn't how people typically think about things, right? This is the first time you've ever heard those words or thought about things in that way, probably. And so people have wondered, I don't know, is that thing even true? Um, more generally, uh, one of the worries might be this thing, this causal principle of ideas looks kind of rigged up. It kind of, you know, it looks made up just to serve Descartes' purposes or something like that. And a related problem here, uh, Descartes claims that the causal principle of ideas is evident by the natural light. It's like two plus two equals four. You just see it, true. No way that could be false. Is that really true of the causal principle of ideas? Is it really evident by the natural light? I mean, who knows? Maybe it's true. But is really, is it self-evident like that? Like you just understand it and boom, got to be true? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Right, so that's the second kind of uh, worry that people have raised about the causal principle of ideas, right? So the first general uh, problem that people have raised uh, for Descartes' argument with the existence of God this causal principle of ideas. I don't know about it. I don't know if it's true. I don't know about this intrinsic representative reality stuff. Uh, even if it is true, is it really evident by the natural light? Ah, uh, right? Okay, so people are worried about that. Okay, fine, fair enough. But, uh, sorry, one, one of the things we saw is, you know, Descartes has something he can say here. It's not that though, once you understand intrinsic reality, representative reality, I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, if the rose causes your idea of the rose, how could your idea of the rose have more information than the actually existing rose? I mean, that seems impossible. And so it's not as though Descartes, um, 
totally resourceless uh, with regard to responding to this first problem. Okay, second problem. Second problem revolves around that second premise. This uh, claim about our idea of God, right? So Descartes claims that we have an idea of God and the way the argument works in brief summary version, right? On the basis of that idea, God is the only one that could cause that idea. And so God must exist. Okay, fine. People have raised problems about what's going on here with Descartes' conception of God and with whether our idea of God actually requires God as its cause. Okay, now to understand the problem that has been raised here, I'm going to use an analogy. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to use an analogy involving an intricate machine. Okay. <clears throat> now, it goes something like this. I might have an idea of an intricate machine, or someone can have, we can have ideas of intricate machines in two different ways, A and B. So I might have an idea of an intricate machine, but not of its intricacies. So not knowing anything about engineering, not knowing anything about how machines work or anything like that, which is true of me, right? I can still think of a machine that's really intricate. It's got all these parts and it's doing all this stuff and it can do everything, right? I can think of a highly intricate machine. I just, you know, what am I doing? I'm just imagining, I don't know, a mess of gears and wires and yeah, everything just, I don't know. I don't know how it ever works. And I can even imagine it doing all kinds of things. It's a time machine and it also gives you soft serve ice cream and it, whatever. You can, it's a boat too. I don't, right? I can, I can imagine a machine with all these gears, all these wires that does all these neat things. Okay, fine. Right? I have an idea of an intricate machine. I have no idea how it would work or whether there could have possibly be such a machine. Right? I just have this idea of this very intricate machine. Now, by contrast, somebody who knows, uh, so that's a A kind of idea. Let's consider now a B kind of idea. So by contrast, there might be someone who knows all kinds of things about engineering. Um, and they might come up with an idea of an intricate machine. And they might come up with an idea of an intricate machine um, uh, where they understand all of the intricacies of the machine. And so when they think of an intricate machine, yeah, they still see a bunch of gears and wires and so on. That's part of their idea. But, but those gears and wires are related. Uh, they understand how they're working. They understand why those gears are here and why those wires connect from there to there because that's how you get the power from there to there to power that gear, which powers that gear, which does this. And right? They understand how all of it works and hangs together. They have an idea of an int intricate machine, but it's different from an A idea of an intricate machine because a B idea, right? the engineer who understands this intricate machine, they understand the intricacies of that intricate machine. They understand how it all fits together, how it all works together. Whereas me, with my I, with my A idea, I don't, I don't know, I'm just imagining a bunch of gears and wires or whatever. Whereas an engineer, say, would understand, no, those gears have to go there and there and there. They have an idea of how the whole machine hangs together, how it all works, and why it can perform the functions that it performs two different kinds of ideas of an intricate machine. Okay, fine. Descartes makes it clear that our idea of God is gonna be more like an A idea. Descartes um, says things about God, our idea of God. Uh, what's included in our idea of God? Well, yeah, God knows everything. Um, God is uh, omnibenevolent. He's all good, right? That's part of our idea of God. God is all powerful. God is all powerful. God is omnibenevolent. God uh, is all knowing. Right? And then there's other things besides, right? But the, God's got these characteristics, got these traits, these omni 
traits, omni traits, whatever. Okay, fine. What Descartes indicates, though, <clears throat> um, and in this he's kind of um, um, following traditional th theology here. <clears throat> he also thinks God is simple. And so there's no kind of division within God. And so all of these traits are actually one thing. God doesn't have different traits, strictly speaking. All of the traits are identical. This is, um, the, it's called the doctrine of divine simplicity. Uh, philosophers, theologians talk about it. We're not going to get into it at all. Descartes clearly an adherent of it. He thinks it's true. But what Descartes says is that it's totally mysterious to us how it's true. Uh, how all these traits are actually the same thing. How having infinite knowledge or all knowledge and being all good are actually one and the same thing. I don't, we don't understand it. We can't really understand God's simplicity. We don't understand how it all works. We don't totally understand God, right? Well, that makes it look like those kinds of claims that Descartes uh, puts forward makes it look like our idea of God is more like an A idea. We, you know, an A idea, you have an idea of a machine, of an intricate machine, but you don't really understand how it all hangs together, how it all works together. Well, that's kind of what Descartes saying about God. We have this idea of God, and yeah, maybe, you know, there's some traits or whatever. We don't understand how it all hangs, hangs together. We don't understand entirely the nature of God. We don't, yeah, right? We can't do that. Descartes says things like that. Well, the problem, finally getting around to the problem, the problem is only B ideas seem to require a cause with a lot of perfection. A ideas, arguably, do not need to be caused by something with a lot of intrinsic perfection. Go back to the machine example. Just any old person with no knowledge of engineering at all, any old totally imperfect and capable person can come up with an idea of an intricate machine. I just did, right? I'm thinking of all these gears and it's a time machine and wires and so on. I, not knowing anything about engineering, could not possibly come up with a B idea. In order to come up with a B idea, you need some sort of perfection. You need to like go study engineering for a few years. Yeah, learn physics and math and whatever. I don't know what else you need to learn. Um, you need to go acquire some real serious knowledge. And then you can come up with an idea like that. You need a certain amount of quote unquote perfection, right? B ideas require that. You need to know about engineering, about physics and mathematics and so on. B ideas seem to require a lot of perfection to have, right? Only engineers can really have those ideas, right? Of how everything hangs together, how it works or whatever, physicists and so on, scientists. Whereas an A idea, that doesn't require much perfection, right? You just have this kind of nebulous, vague idea and I don't know how it actually all hangs together or whether it works or how it works. I don't really know, I don't know, right? That doesn't require any special perfection or knowledge or skill, right? I, anybody can think of something like that. But given that Descartes seems to think our, our idea of God is more like an A idea, well, that would imply that our idea of God doesn't actually need a perfect cause, doesn't actually need a cause that has lots of in, uh, intrinsic perfection. Maybe anybody could have come up with it in the same way that little old me with no knowledge of engineering come up with these, uh, an A idea of an intricate machine. Well, so too, maybe I could come up with this A idea of God, which Descartes clearly asserts, right? Our idea of God is more like an A idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I came up with that. If we had an idea of God where we understood how it all worked, how it all hung together, we understood the nature and essence of God. Well, well yeah, maybe that would require God as its cause. Sure, fine. But that's not what our idea of God is like. We don't understand how exactly God works, right? There's still a lot of mystery bound up with how exactly God works. 
our idea of God is more like an A idea. Ideas like that don't require a lot of perfection. That's the problem <clears throat> that people have raised. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, the more serious problem for Descartes' argument. All right, last thing that Descartes does in the third meditation is establish that God's not a deceiver. All right, so put the, argue, the, the problems uh, with Descartes' argument for the existence of God to the side. By the time we get right around to the end of the third meditation, Descartes has proved that God exists, right? And if you recall where we started, Descartes trying to prove that God exists and that God's not a deceiver. And if he can do that, he'll have eliminated the only reason he has for doubting the truth rule. And if he can eliminate the only reason he has for doubting the truth rule, he'll have established or validated the truth rule. And he can, he can put that onto his structure, right? And start building on top of that. And so the last thing he needs to do in order to validate the truth rule is prove that God, who uh, he has just proved exists, he needs to show that God is not a deceiver. And that's what he does at the very end of the third meditation. Okay. <clears throat> First premise familiar by now. He's just kind of rehearsing something he's already talked about. God has all perfections and no defects. This is just another way of saying God has infinite reality, right? That was all over the argument for the existence of God. That's part of the content of our idea of God. God is infinitely perfect. God is infinitely real, has infinite reality. Reality and perfection are interchangeable for De Descartes. And so when, God, uh, when uh, Descartes says that God has all perfections, that's just another way of saying God is, uh, has infinite reality. Same thing, right? God is infinitely perfect. God is infinitely real, has infinite reality. All those things are the same exact thing. Okay, so that's the first claim. And Descartes would say, look, that's just, that's true of your idea. And you just show, we've just shown that uh, that idea that we have, this idea with infinite representative reality, that a being exists with infinite intrinsic reality. That's the only way I could have this idea. That being that exists has infinite intrinsic reality, has all, it has infinite perfection. That's the first claim. What he then claims is that deception and fraud are defects. They are imperfections. And what he says, and you might think, well, yeah, that seems true, right? That's like a bad thing to do, to deceive somebody, to lie to somebody. That's bad. That's an imperfect thing to do. It's a defect. It's a defective character, we might say. Yeah, something like that. Descartes says this, well, where does he get that from? Does he just say it out of nowhere? He says it's clear by the natural light. We know by the natural light that deception and fraud are defects. Well, if God is infinitely perfect and has no defect, and if deception is a defect, that implies that God is not a deceiver. And so this God who is infinitely real, infinitely perfect, who we have proved exists, can't deceive, doesn't deceive. God is infinitely perfect. Deception is an imperfection. God is not going to engage in deception. God is not going to deceive. Pretty simple. That's the argument for the claim that God is not a deceiver, right? So that one is much more straightforward. Um, there isn't all of this uh, new terminology, any kind of novel distinctions. All right, so having now proved that God is not a deceiver, uh, Descartes has accomplished what he set out to do in the third meditation. Um, he doesn't, it would be nice if he did this, but he doesn't do this. He doesn't bring everything back together and kind of tie it up very nicely with a bow at the end of the third meditation. It'd be nice if he did, he doesn't. But having now shown that God exists and God is not a deceiver, Descartes has validated the truth rule. He never, he doesn't bring this to our attention. That's what it would be nice. That would be tying it up with a bow. If he kind of brought back the truth rule and say, hey, look, now, We've validated this thing. We can throw this onto our structure of knowledge. We can help ourselves to the truth rule. He never really says that, but that's in effect what has happened. 
so we have a lot more that we're building back up now. We've got, I think I exist from the second meditation. Now we know that God exists. So I, I think I exist. God exists. God's not a deceiver. And so we can throw on top of all of that the truth rule. And now we're kind of off and running, according to Descartes. And what we're going to look at next time is kind of the continuation of the project. We have these few things Descartes going to start building back up even further. We still don't, at this point at least, know whether or not you actually have a hand. In the sixth meditation, Descartes is going to argue, no, you actually know. You do have a hand. You can uh, figure that out. But we'll see how that works.